Good evening, everyone. My name is Claire Regan. I'm president-elect of the Society of Professional Journalists. I'm uh, speaking to you from New York City, my home base. Uh, I've been a professional journalist for over 30 years at my hometown paper, the Staten Island Advance, and uh, also a college professor teaching journalism at Wagner College, my alma mater. I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Adam Sennett invited me to moderate this discussion between in two distinguished journalists. I am going to introduce them to you right now. Um, we have Macarena Hernandez. Um, she is a multimedia journalist and an educator and a quintista or storyteller as her LinkedIn profile passionately proclaims. Uh, while a student at Baylor University, Macarena interned at the New York Times and following graduation became a bureau chief for the San Antonio Express News. In 2003, a New York Times reporter who had interned alongside her was caught plagiarizing a story she had written for the Express News. That reporter turned out to be Jason Blair. The revelation uncovered dozens of other stories Blair had plagiarized or fabricated for the Times, setting off a national media story. Macarena holds a BA in English professional writing and journalism from Baylor and a master's in journalism from the University of California. She's also a former editorial columnist at Dallas Morning News. And her academic appointments have included the Fred Hartman Distinguished Professor of Journalism at Baylor. And I think I discovered that you are, Macarena, a certified yoga instructor. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I like that detail, so I threw it in. Um, is, is there anything else that you'd like to add or that I missed? No. Good, okay. All right, on to our other distinguished guest tonight. Charles Lane, Chuck Lane, an editorial writer and weekly columnist for the Washington Post, specializing in economic and fiscal policy. He was editor of the New Republic, the in-flight magazine of Air Force One from 1997 to 1999, when staff reporter Stephen Glass fabricated significant portions or all of 27 out of 41 stories. The 2003 movie Shattered Glass documents the scandal, one of the largest in contemporary American journalism. After leaving the New Republic, uh, Charles went on to work for The Post, where from 2000 to 2009, he covered the US Supreme Court and issues related to the criminal justice system. He is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and a frequent panelist on Fox News Channel's Special Report and Fox News Sunday. Uh, Charles, did I miss anything there? Do you want to add anything? <laughs> could I, uh, you can I, I tell you, I just want to confess I'm no good at yoga, but otherwise. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> um, I also do want to say um, welcome to the members of the New England chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, um, the sponsoring chapter for tonight's discussion. So thank you for putting this together for us. I guess I'll, I'll kick off our conversation. And by the way, anybody who's on the Zoom uh, call can uh, enter a question in the chat at any time during the discussion tonight. I'll be checking the chat for questions. So feel free to uh, add one at any time. But I'll kick off the conversation uh, with flashback, with a flashback. Uh, maybe we'll get some additional context if you each could take us back to the scandal time just to set the tone for our conversation. Um, maybe briefly describe, I, I, I briefly described it myself, but if you want to add any details about how it unfolded and, and maybe if you noticed any warning signs for the two people involved, since you were, you know, working with them, if you want to, you know, uh, share any personality traits or interactions that, that you recall from those times, we'll start with you, Macarena. Hi, thank you all for organizing this conversation. I um, was working at the San Antonio Express News in 2003, uh, shortly after the war in Iraq had started. And so soldiers had started coming back to Texas in coffins. And so there was a story about a local soldier in Los Fresnos, Texas, that had not gotten a lot of coverage. They had gotten a lot of local coverage, but not much national coverage. And he had been part of the convoy that had been 
kidnapped or had, you know, at the time we didn't know where, where these soldiers were, but we did know that one of them was missing and he was missing for about three weeks before the San Antonio Express News, me, wrote about it. And then the story appeared in the New York Times eight days later. And it was remarkable how much of my story, mm -hmm. uh, how much of Jason's stories mirrored my story. And probably because very few people had written about this story. So there wasn't a lot of material to pull from. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was very noticeable. I called my editors and, um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I called my editors on a Saturday morning and gave them a heads up and uh, the the editor at the time was going to write to them on Monday and ask them for ask the New York Times for an apology or mm -hmm. acknowledgement or I mean, I'm really not sure what what they were asking, but the the uh, they found the young man's body during that span. Um, so I'm back at the, by then I know that I've been plagiarized and I've told my editors, but I'm back at this young man's house because their ship, they, the, the family had found out that they found his body and he, he, was, he was dead. And so while I'm at this, uh, at their home, and by then the mother didn't want to talk to anyone, you know, uh, I run into a Washington Post reporter and he says to me, do you freelance for the New York Times? And I said, no, are you asking me? Because my story and Jason's story were similar. And he said, oh yeah, I, was, I came here to basically do the same story. And the mother's no longer talking to reporters. And then I sat at a local restaurant and started reading all the stories the library had pulled for me. And I noticed they were similar. And I said to him, I said, I, I, I wanted to come and see with my own eyes because in the New York Times story, he wrote that the Martha Stewart patio furniture was out in the patio. And I had taken great lengths not to say that because it was actually in a box next to the kitchen table. And I, you know, and I remember laboring over that line because it wasn't poetic enough, you know, it was kind of like, so, you know, that confirmed it for me. The moment I got to the house to try and get an interview with the mother, the, the day after that story ran, uh, a follow-up, and then, and then really just confirming that there was no patio fur furniture. For me in that moment, I thought, oh, wow, he didn't even come down to South Texas. I'm so glad you pointed out that the furniture detail because um, I use, uh, I compare the two stories like many other college professors do, of course, I'm sure to show how uh, some of the material was plagiarized and that was a big detail there were some other details too about fabric or some other details in the story that we were you shocked because you knew jason blair from interning right were you were you surprised that he plagiarized you <clears throat> i'm surprised any journalist would plagiarize mm -hmm. you know i feel like we have such a incredible uh, uh like a world of people eager to tell their stories. I'm always shocked that people want to talk to reporters and that they do it so honestly and openly. And so I'm always shocked when someone takes shortcuts because, I mean, I consider it, you know, I, I, I like Jason, grew up Baptist uh, in South Texas. And I, and I literally considered journalism my calling, you know, like a sort of vocation. And, um, and I feel like there is this deep trust between you and the readership and the people you write about that, um, I mean, it is, it's, it's very deep, but it's also at the same time can easily fall apart, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it must have almost felt a little personal because you did know each other. So, you know, I'm sure it was just shocking. Um, let me move over to Chuck and um, maybe you could tell us, bring us back to the 90s <laughs> right seems like a long time ago now and yes. um and just set the scene for us about uh, what was unfolding at the new republic under your watch without you knowing uh, it at first <laughs> thank you very much claire um well it has been a long time and uh, almost 25 years 23 now and um i guess um i i just turned 60 and I was in my 30s when this all happened. 
So I guess it's fair to say it's taken up almost half of my life at this point. Uh, it's the kind of the story that people are fascinated by endlessly. Um, to answer your question does require making a small modification to the bio mm -hmm. you presented, which is that actually, even though I was editor from 97 to 99, a lot of the fabrications occurred before I was editor, actually. Senior editor before that? Is that was that your title? Yes, but it, that was a title, but it was mostly a writing job. Yeah. And as it happened, I had been on leave for about six months during that period as well. So I really kind of came into the editorship in 97, whereas with Steve already, Steve Glass already being established as this great gifted storyteller. And that was part of the reason actually that I didn't smell a rat, so to speak, mm -hmm. until much later, because he had kind of developed under previous editors and seemed to come fully vetted by the time uh, I became the editor. And there's a, obviously, as perhaps some of you in, in the group here have seen the movie, there's a lot of detail I could go into. But um, the short of it is that in about the May of 1998, I got uh, a call from Forbes, the website of Forbes, where they were having trouble matching a story that Stephen Glass had done. And uh, they thought perhaps I could check it out because it seemed very unusual to them that there would be all of these uh, sources and individuals mentioned in a story that they couldn't possibly trace. And uh, so I did check into it and I, over the course of a pretty harrowing 48 hours, discovered that not only that story, but many others seemed to have been completely fabricated mm. and uh, had to confront Stephen Glass over that. And uh, um, maybe, uh, I mean, maybe it will surprise some people in the, in the, in the audience because um, it did turn into a Hollywood movie completely unexpected to me in which I was portrayed as this guy who sort of got to the bottom of the case. But when it all happened, I was sure that I was finished. You know, I was sure that my career was over because I would be blamed for letting this whole thing happen. And um, maybe that explains in a way why, looking back on it, I was so aggressive about trying to uh, get to the bottom of it at the time, because I was terrified of being accused of a cover up. You know what I mean? I, I felt like I had to be completely transparent and expose everything before the people from outside Forbes went public with it so that we couldn't be accused of doing a cover up. So maybe that was, I took counsel of my fears, but it was a good thing. Well, you were quite a young editor too. You were the editor of the publication at the time. And you, were, you just said you were in your thirties. And yeah. the, staff, the staff was also quite young, as you can see in the Shattered Glass movie, that's you know pointed out that they were all in their twenties and thirties. So did you think that factored into the sort of the climate or the culture of the new yes. situation? Yeah. I, I think it was, um, I think it was part of the problem. I think an advantage I had, I mean, I guess I was probably 36 or 37 when this was all happening. And that seems very young to me now, but that made me one of the oldest people at the New Republic at the time. And actually, I had, I had, had some experience in reporting, um, you know, overseas and other areas and had exposed separately what I consider to be a hoax in another area. So possibly those... Um, experiences benefited me. Mm -hmm. um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the, the, it was not so much the youth of the staff, but the um, instability of leadership. We had gone through a bunch of leadership changes and that kind of thing had, had kind of allowed, in hindsight, this wasn't so clear to me at the time, had allowed our processes and our internal culture to get a little right. out of control. And Steve Glass kind of exploited that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Oh, thank you both for giving some context to uh, the scandals. Um, and, and Katie Kostakis, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, she's asking a question that's on my list. And since it's come up, I'll ask it, I'll ask it to you now. Have either of you had face-to-face -face conversations with Blair and Glass, uh, Blair and Glass in the years since the scandals? Either of you, um, have you spoken to Blair and Glass? Uh, we'll start with you, Macarena. Have you been in touch at all? No, uh, I have not been in touch with Jason. I, he did call me um, 
uh, I think that the Washington Post reporter being there and then calling Howard Kurtz after talking to me really accelerated the story. Mm -hmm. And um, I the by then the Washington Post by Monday the Washington Post was on it, and uh, Howard Kurtz was right was investigating it. And so I got a call on that Monday in the middle of the day from Jason, and he wanted to um, ask me if I about a quote about the story, which was which was bizarre anyways. And, and I told him, I said, oh my God, you have access to a database. I'm sure you could pull my story. And he said he hadn't read my story. And uh, I said to him, you know, I am pretty sure you read my story because it reads the same. And, um, and then he said, I'm just calling because I wanna verify a quote that the daughter translated uh, for the mother. And at that moment, like any doubt I had, was gone because had Jason Blair interviewed Juanita Guillano, the mother of this mm -hmm. soldier, he would have known that she spoke English. Mm -hmm. He did not need a translator. So it was that moment, it was the last time we spoke and it was before this thing kind of exploded because I think the Washington Post ended up writing this, uh, running the story like that Tuesday and then everything just kind of. Yeah snowballed after that, right? Um, how about you, Chuck? Um, has uh, Stephen Glass reached out to you for a, a letter of recommendation or anything <laughs> since the not, scandal? <laughs> not, not exactly. Um, I have not, there's only one exception, but in the 20 plus years since this all happened, I have not had any personal contact with Stephen Glass mm -hmm. in, in person. Um, the exception is that about 10 years ago, I think it was actually 2009, uh, Steve applied for admission to the California bar. And there was a proceeding in California. It was a kind of, uh, it's not exactly a trial, but it was trial-like, a kind of hearing internal to the bar. And I was subpoenaed as a witness. And I had to walk into this courtroom and uh, testify and there across the courtroom sitting with his lawyers was Stephen Glass. Wow. Um, so that was, and we didn't exchange, I mean, I testified, but we didn't exchange any words and his lawyers cross-examined me very briefly, I might add, not Stephen himself. If I may, I would just like to say as a footnote, I'm, I'm struck by Macarena's note that the post was sort of involved in <laughs> My, my, my current newspaper. Newspaper, yeah. And, and there is um, a kind of a, an interesting wrinkle to this that perhaps people aren't aware of. You know, many of the stories that Jason Blair fabricated were about the famous Washington Post sniper case, which, um, uh, you know, ravaged the D.C. area. And it was a local story for us at that time in the year, I think it was 2001. Mm -hmm. And our Metro staff was furious because it seemed like this kid from New York, Jason Blair, was getting all these scoops and their editors were on their backs. Like, why don't you have these stories Jason Blair has got? And of course, the reason was he was making them up. Yeah. Um, and so I got to believe that some one reason The Washington Post was uh, somewhat aggressive about helping to expose him later on was was for that reason i don't recollect actually but i remember the feeling in our newsroom was that great indignation uh that he had done that especially because it was a competitive story mm -hmm. on our mm -hmm. in our area mm -hmm. yeah that was one of his big assignments the sniper case i do i do know that um now each you know glass and blair they each wrote books after the scandals uh subsided and um Blair wrote Burning Down My Master's House, and Stephen Glass wrote The Fabulist. I'm just wondering, did either of you purchase the books, either book, or would you confide that you, or share that you wrote, that you actually read the book, or I, I, I know a lot of journalists said, I, I, won't, I won't buy those books. I do not want to support, you know, bad behavior, and um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, or if you did take a peek. We'll start with Macarena. 
No, I didn't buy the book. You know, quite honestly, I was so sick of the story because it went on and on and on. And it's because it was journalists involved and we were really into the story. Uh, and, and so I just, first off, considering all the mistakes uh, that had led to this and the fabrications and the plagiarism, I didn't really feel like I could trust whatever mm -hmm. he wrote. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like so soon after it had happened that there was no time for reflection, you know? And so I don't think I would have gleaned anything differently. So it didn't feel, uh, and then there were people writing, including um, the managing editor, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Gerald Boyd. Mm -hmm. He wrote about how he, that he had looked through the book and Jason had gotten all these uh, information about his family and his mother wrong. You know, so there are people calling out the book and um, it, I didn't, yeah, I didn't have, I had no interest in, in, in reading it. Hmm. Thank you for being so candid. How about you, Chuck? Did you uh, take a peek at The Fabulist? Did you go to see if you were mentioned in there? <laughs> well, I considered... I, I didn't I didn't buy it, but although I considered stealing it, <laughs> um, but I didn't do that. I didn't do that either. Um, no, uh, somebody actually sent me a review copy, predictably, and of course the difference is it it's a it's a novel, right? Um, it it is, but it to anybody who worked at the New Republic at that time, you can tell it's clearly a Roman Acle. You know, people. It's obvious that he's taken mm -hmm. uh, the the members of the New Republic staff and just converted them into very lightly fictionalized characters. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of feelings about the book um, when I, I did read the whole thing. Um, uh, basically that I felt it showed at the time, and this I think was 2003, so this is a long time ago, that Steve really wasn't um, fully repentant um, because you could tell he was anybody Anybody on the staff who had helped to expose him, and I wasn't the only one, um, is portrayed badly <laughs> in yeah. the book. And and the Stephen Glass character is portrayed somewhat more sympathetically. I mean, it's not a terrific novel. I think the idea the publisher must have had was, well, this guy fabricated these uh, very colorful features. He'd probably be a good novelist. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it, the book, the book actually didn't get very good reviews, even right. from people, uh, and, um, kind of fell flat. So yeah, that was my experience with the book. And I believe, um, uh, Jason Blair's book, um, burning down my master's house had that, has that famous lead. I lied, I lied. And then I lied some more, <laughs> um, kind of a powerful lead. Um, how about the, the films, um, Mac Ryan? Raina, have you seen A Fragile Trust about this Blair scandal? And uh, Chuck, have you seen Shattered Glass? We'll start with Macarena. I did see A Fragile Trust, and I remember thinking, who named this movie? And then I <laughs> and it's see- it's a documentary. Myself. I just want to point that out. Yeah, I should say it's a documentary. Yeah. And, then I, and then I hear myself saying those words, it's A Fragile Trust, which it is really, uh, I mean, as it is, I think, uh, the public doesn't really trust the media, whatever that means yeah. for people, right? And so, um, it, it, yes, so I don't even, it, I was gonna go down that road about just the, 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 the trust. I did see the documentary and it's, it was very interesting um, recap, you know? Mm -hmm. It's always so interesting to, it may, the, this whole experience for me made me really think about the way in which we center certain people and, and, and the kind of why objectivity is so hard because as a reporter, you're making all kinds of decisions, including what source you're gonna center to be the narrative that defines, you know, which you, you end up corroborating with others. You know, there's so many just very new, even just what sources you trust, right? Mm -hmm. or, or if you speak the language, what people you have access to. So um, I, I just see every everything that comes out about this. It's so interesting to, mm -hmm. to connect it back to my memories of how everything unfolded, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and just to see, you know, uh, what threats get played up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I appreciate it that the movie, that the documentary, I should clarify, um, that it did touch on the fact that 
it, that this whole conversation about plagiarism, which never happens when the plagiarist is white, when it's a person of color, then it becomes a conversation about race. And that, and I, and I appreciate it that the documentary touched on that because that really was an over, I was so struck and shocked that that became the focus of the, the many news stories that came out. Yes, it really, it was a sidebar at first, but then it sort of dominated the whole story. You're right about that. That's interesting. How about you, Chuck? Um, um, how do you think Peter Sarsgaard portrayed you in, <laughs> uh, in, the, in Shattered Glass, which was a Holly, which is a Hollywood movie? Yeah. It's cl I, pretty close to being a documentary, wouldn't you say? It's pretty close. It's, in it's interesting. Um, when, uh, when I found out that I was going to be played by Peter Sarsgaard in this movie, I'd never heard of him before. <laughs> and uh, so I went and I looked up his filmography. And in the, in the previous film, he had played somebody who had committed a horrible murder and was sentenced to death row. So I was a little concerned that <laughs> this might be typecasting. But actually, he, <laughs> um, he made me look a lot better than I really am. Um, I, I feel like it's so interesting to hear Macarena discuss the documentary in terms of the choices of what to include and what to consider authoritative and what to leave out. Because really, um, Billy Ray, who made Shattered Glass, was doing the same thing, even in the context of what is essentially a docudrama and has a lot of fictional elements in it. Um, and I feel that um, I'm very often asked whether the movie is you know, a very realistic or accurate portrayal of what happened. And in parentheses, I have to admit, at times I can't remember anymore what's real and what's movie. Yeah. But um, I feel that he chose a pretty fair storyline all the way through and you know, compressed where he had to. And, and at certain times though, quoted verbatim because he had certain transcripts of certain conversations from the Forbes team in his hands, either as tape or verbatim transcript. And um, it's a little bit like, um, I, I would draw a comparison between like the Shakespeare play Othello and the opera version of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the opera condenses the play to its dramatic essence. And I think that's what Shattered Glass did to the real Steve Glass scandal, sort of compressed it to its, its essential storyline. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I have to admit, and I've told Billy this, I was astonished anybody went to see the movie um, because it's like about office politics and it has no sex. No sex, and, no violence really either. Really, Or no car chase. No. But he very, very skillfully showed the tension and the psychological uh, workings of the situation, and it, it drew people in. Well, I know from a college educator perspective, I mean, it's a great way to teach what to do by teaching what not to do. Students learn a lot by studying Jason Blair and Stephen Glass because they learn what not to do. I hope um, so. Yes, it, it's very successful in the classroom. Um, just moving on, I'm just, I'm going to go back to um, uh, Blair and Glass and just, you know, they've both struggled in some ways after the scandals, understandably so. Uh, um, Chuck mentioned that um, uh, Stephen Glass has, has tried to be, to get admitted to the bar. I know he tried in New York as well, California and New York, I believe, and uh, unsuccessfully. Um, not really quite sure what he's doing today, but I know that has been a disappointment for him, and 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 Jason Blair, I believe Macarena is, um, he he is a life coach um, in New York. So um, I'm wondering if you think, you know, is it just punishment that they really can never be journalists again? Um, it, does the punishment fit the crime? Because that's clearly, you know, they're banished from the world of journalism. Do you think that's a just punishment? you think that's a good message? We'll start with that, Karina. What I tell my students is it's the, the only thing you have is this trust with your readers, it's this trust with your editors. And once that's gone, it's gone. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing because people won't trust you. Mm -hmm. Your editors won't trust you, your readers won't trust you. So 
it is something so delicate and valuable that you have to guard and that you always have to, your ethic moral compass has to be your guiding light as a journalist. Because that's how you get to write about other people doing bad things is by being as, as uh, you know, as best as you can, you can live your life because or else you don't really get to call other people because people won't listen to you. Mm -hmm. And you unfortunately lose that perch and it's not a decision I make. That's one of the questions that I get asked a lot is do you think uh, like, do you think that Jason deserves a second chance? Mm -hmm. And I think everyone deserves a second chance. It's too bad that in journalism, people hardly get one. And that's why it's so important that uh, you stick to a clean record because that's this is not the kind of job where you get second chances, unfortunately. No. But, um, uh, but I do feel people get, uh, you know, I believe in redemption. <laughs> you know, I believe in second acts. I believe people can change. I believe people can reflect and, um, I think that someone who has seen the the depths that someone like Jason has seen of failure and and then and this was pre social media pile on and even then it was so I would watch the coverage and I worried about him mm -hmm. and his mental health and you know um, and how he was holding up because I cannot imagine you know uh, having the whole world shine up shine like an interrogation light on you and what that would be like. So it, I, I think that people who, I, I bet that some of you, I mean, I don't know because I haven't talked to Jason, but I can imagine that if you've had a fall from grace um, like that, you might be able to help people who've had the same experience. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because one of my questions is also, do you have any compassion? I, I do here's some compassion in your answer correct me if i'm wrong but because i know he was struggling at the time he has discussed that with katie Couric and other interviews about you know there was some drugs and some other personal issues emotional problems i mean do you look back and or, or do you feel compassion for what he went through and what he did oh i of course you know i yeah. feel compassion for him as a as a young i always tell my students when i get well, I look at all of you and I think about your parents and I think about all the people that made it possible for you to sit in this classroom. And I and I think about the same with anyone, you know, that's going through um, a rough time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that it was too soon at the time to come out and try and explain because uh, I don't think he had, like I said, the space or the reflection or he was not gonna in a place to say, um, to really evaluate his choices at the time. And also, I think the world wasn't ready to hear. Um, right. But then it's like, yeah, so. Yeah, good point. And we'll go over to you, Chuck. I mean, um, do you think, uh, should should Stephen Glass be forgiven for what he did? Should he get another chance to, uh, in journalism or in law? Should he get a chance in law? And do you have any compassion for his personal situation at the time? I mean, in the film, we saw a very emotional suicidal we think St Stephen Glass at the end there. So um, your thoughts on that? Well, it's it's something, believe it or not, I th have thought about, I wouldn't say every day, but on a regular basis ever since this all happened um, and kind of go back and forth in my mind about all the little points that you raised. And I think Macarena has already touched on a lot of the considerations. I mean, we have to start with the fact that both of these people we're in their mid twenties when this happened mm. or when they did this. And so right away, you think differently about them than you would if they were in mid career in their forties say, and should, you know, should have known better. Of course, we know that it does sometimes happen that people at that stage of their career commit these kinds of offenses anyway. And to me, the key variable is what is the attitude of the person after they're caught, hmm. how, um, how do they attempt to deal with the damage and how open they are to admitting in detail what they've done wrong and how, I, I agree with Macarena, they can never kind of recover their integrity as journalists, but as a human being, it is possible to recover your integrity, I believe. That's good to and, distinguish that, very good, yeah. yeah. And, and so while I don't think I would ever 
I don't think anybody would ever hire Steve Glass again as a journalist. I think the rest of the world and you know other things are open to him. And you know the 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 law thing that's kind of out of my hands. Right. You know, I think as a practical matter, Claire, mm -hmm. he is famous for being a liar. That's mm -hmm. his problem. I mean, this movie has literally been translated into Japanese, you know, so oh. the whole world knows that this guy is a liar and it's a, yeah. or was, and, and it's a very hard problem for any bar to kind of overcome that. Mm -hmm. But in my, in my own mind, I think he has done a lot of things since this all happened that suggest he's trying to convince people that he's a different person. And I know people who I respect who believe that. And um, for myself, I guess I have just kind of given up. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not in my hands. It's not something, frankly, that's relevant to what I'm doing anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I do hope, like, you know, he finds, he finds his niche. And I, he is working as a paralegal and has been working as a paralegal, as I understand Yeah, it. that's what I thought. Yes. Yeah, and, you know, that seems okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he's trying to make a living, right? So yeah, entitled to do so. Thank you for your thoughts on that. And a related question um, in the chat: um, Did these did these two individuals, these two former journalists, did they increase the distrust that we see in the media? Do you think, or did they sort of start the ball rolling in that direction? I mean, we face a lot of distrust today, and do you think that? either one contributed to it or sort of sparked it in any way, their bad behavior? Well, um, Chuck? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I guess time. on you that one, I, I, don't, I don't feel that either case caused the decline in public trust. I think they may have contributed to it. Right. And yet at the same time, I'm impressed looking back on how much worse the lies have gotten in our society than, than these cases. Um, uh, false things now are routinely uh, broadcast, uh, and they're not like picturesque feature stories about uh, invented uh, teenage computer hackers like Steve Glass was making up. They're, they're fabrications about what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. And um, pizza, you know, parlors that supposedly have child sex rings being run out of the back and those find their way into social media. I mean, social media has completely transformed this whole issue mm -hmm. and has put the, the average person on this sort of strangely unstable ground that we're all kind of what can we what's true and what's uh, what's a deep fake. And so I, I think. Obviously, these two incidents are iconic, and they they come up in all the journalism discussions and classes and books and stuff. But we have gone way beyond that now. I believe maybe Macarena disagrees in terms of all the factors that are uh, destabilizing public trust. Well, I'll tell you, most people that I come into contact are not reading the New York Times or the Washington Post. They're getting their news from Facebook or they're getting their news from TikTok. And so um, the real problem is the amount of misinformation and disinformation out in the community, more than the bad apple that'll occasionally cut corners in a newsroom. The real problem, I mean, th those stories get a lot of att attention because there's a person you can point to, but the real problem that I see is the amount of misinformation, disinformation. People don't know the difference between a column in a news story uh, and there are less and less people, and I work with a lot of teachers and people who appreciate writing. And I'm always, I'm never shocked. I'm shocked when someone in, in my workshops reads a newspaper. That's when I'm shocked because, uh, and I'm talking about teachers. I'm talking about people that are out in the world, uh, professionals. And so for me, I think uh, the, the problem with social media is how it magnifies and amplifies a lot of misinformation and most people are not media trained enough to understand what they're consuming. Good point. Can I add something to that, Claire? Yeah, sure, please. Um, you know, I've often reflected also on the fact that the people who discovered 
Steve Glass's misconduct. We're now talking the year mid-1998, okay? Search engines were in their infancy, mm -hmm. but they were good with those. I mean, this was technology that had just come on the scene. People were just learning how to handle it. It was really primitive, but they were very good at it. And that accelerated their ability in real time to check Steve's stories. So um, in a funny way, it was the infancy of the internet and social media that made it possible to um, expose this fraud at the time. And for many years after that, it was something that made me quite optimistic about the impact of the internet and social media on the, uh, the quality of information that the public would consume because information was suddenly very, and, and good information in addition to bad, but good information was very, very cheap and readily available, much more than it had ever been before. But as Macarena points out, and I don't know exactly when and how it happened, but that process has slipped into a different gear yeah. and now it's having very perverse effects. Mm. Very good point, excellent point. Um, obviously, uh, their, their two publications survived the scandals and are still around today, fortunately. Um, what did they do right to survive? What did the New York Times do right, Macarena? And what did the New Republic, and you, you were involved in the, in the, in the decisions, uh, Chuck, what, what did they do right to survive such big scandal? Um, and can we learn anything from that you know, in our newsrooms today? Well, I haven't worked at the New York Times since the 90s, so I wouldn't know uh, really like what they've done to survive except com continue to, to produce great journalism like the Washington Post and continue to adapt to the multimedia way of telling stories by producing podcasts and, and columns and doc form. I mean, I think that's, that's uh, and, and, you know, I think the general public has a very a short attention span yeah. anyways. And um, um, yeah, I mean, I love, I, I, the Washington Post and the New York Times are my go-to mm -hmm. publications. I will say that it's interesting that Chuck mentioned that there was also a management issue at the New Republic that kind of led to this, which I think a lot of people in retrospect would say the same about the New York Times that Jason kind of felt through management, there were cracks and big management wasn't talking to middle management and people were just being, you know, and so editors editors knew what was going on, but no one was listening to them. So it's, I think that that strong management obviously keeps the, the trains running on time. And when it's not working, stuff like yeah, this. Anything. Agreed, and they are both young, you know, eager, eager young uh, journalists, eager to make an impression, eager to, get, eager to get the big stories, right? So you had that compounding the whole situation. But uh, I mean, the New York Times um, transparency, I think both publications realized that transparency was important, admitting what had happened, explaining how it came about, how it happened, um, you know, the, the New York Times published a, an enormous report on the front page about uh, and looked into it um, step by step. And there were some fire, you know, res resignations and the public editor role was established. So I think, um, you know, the, I think there were some good steps that came after the scandal and maybe influenced other newsrooms for hiring and being cautious. Um, and same thing with the New Republic. I know very transparent about what happened um, and how it happened, yes. right? I mean, I think that's we, a big part of it. Be. And they get kudos for that. Go ahead, Chuck. Thank you, Claire. I think that was, um, if, if I can go back further in history, one of the things that happened in the middle of this whole thing was uh, I had a copy at the time of Ben Bradley's memoir on my bookshelf, you know, the late great editor of the Washington Post. And I pulled it down to read the chapter on Janet Cook, <laughs> which is another famous fabrication scandal. Like I was saying, like, how did Bradley handle this? You know, <laughs> and uh, the thing that jumped out at me was that they ordered this big investigation conducted in-house at the Post to go through the whole situation. And so I really felt like, OK, we have to do the same thing for just the reason you said transparency 
And again, going back to my initial instinct, which was that no matter, and this is another Bradley saying, I guess, or Woodward and Bernstein saying, the cover up is worse than the crime. I never wanted anybody else to get out ahead of us on the story of exposing what Stephen Glass had done, because I wanted there to be not even a hint that we were hiding anything. And um, I do feel good about that. And by the way, I think it was therapeutic for the staff to join in that effort and, and do that scrub of all the stories to really kind of see what had happened. And I, I would say though, as a kind of a footnote, I think that is the hardest part still for journalism is being transparent about our errors. And I think being eager to be transparent about our errors. So much of the distrust we are talking about that is reflected toward the media, I consider is almost like a backward compliment. I feel so much that when people are expressing like, quote unquote, hate to the media, a lot of it is, is born of disappointment where they feel like we're not, they, they actually believe we have an honorable mission and, and ethics. And they get very, dis, I'm talking about readers generally, very disappointed when they feel we're not really holding them up. You know, and I think the best way we can do that is to lean into the job of transparency about our own process and our own errors. I, I have to say that um, uh, I think we have a lot. Of, I think we have a lot of work to do on that mm -hmm. because it's risky and painful. But that was by far the best move we made mm -hmm. back in the day, 25 years ago, because at the end, nobody could accuse us of a cover up. That was it. We laid it all out. How do you think news organizations can avoid hiring a Stephen Glass or a Jason Blair? Do you have any advice for the managers out there? Or, um... Well, I don't know, Macarena. <laughs> I think for every Jason Blair, there are many, many, many more young journalists who are so eager to change right. the world and they're idealistic and it's unfortunate that then this becomes the the barometer or how we we measure mm -hmm. students because they're not the norm and that's what i keep telling people this isn't most people i know that are journalists they're the most they really are i mean <coughs> no one is getting into journalism because they think they're gonna become yeah they're gonna, they're gonna get rich you know what i mean there's yeah. a there's a lot of personal curiosity and and often, you know, you have to move around to parts of the country where your family doesn't live. I mean, you're always chasing a story. And so those are those are the majority of the yeah. of the people out there. And, and in this market, they're eager to get hired. So yeah, there's a lot of sacrifice. There's a lot of sacrifice involved in journalism. I, I agree with I agree with what she said. And I've always I've always told people there's basically two kinds of people in this world. Those who would do something like what Jason and Stephen did and those who would never even think of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the second category is like much larger. Thank goodness. <laughs> like 99 <laughs> to one out of a hundred. And if you're screening applicants, I feel I haven't done it in a long time, but the best way to make darn sure you're getting one of the vast majority as opposed to that rare bad apple is really scrub the resume, mm -hmm. right? Because people do lie on their resumes. Mm -hmm. And if they'll do that, they might lie in a news story yeah. too. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, it's, it's an interesting fact about Janet Cook's case at the Post that um, she lied on her resume. She claimed that she was fluent in French. And nobody checked that out. Hmm. But if they had checked it out, none of this would have ever happened. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, we can check people on social media too, you know, on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we can check them out that way. There's lots of different avenues now to sort of conduct an investigation on um, and see uh, consistency or inconsistency, right? But I know, I know a lot of the, the Blair and Glass scandals made managers very, you know, skittish about hiring and, um, and maybe that's a good thing, um, you know, improving hiring practices and newsrooms is a good thing. Um, so maybe, maybe if we think about, are they still relevant today, you know, more than two decades later for Stephen Glass, almost two decades for Jason Blair, are, are these two former journalists still relevant today? Certainly they are in the college classroom. I know for me, they are especially. 
but as journalists, is it good for journalists to know who they were? Oh, absolutely. And, and chances are, if you're working in a newsroom, you probably read about either Glass mm -hmm. or Blair in college, you know, because they are great ways to teach young people, like you said, Claire, what about what not to what do, not to do yeah. and how what what kinds of consequences come mm -hmm. from making these decisions. And I always tell my students these shortcuts, if you take shortcuts in college, you're going to take shortcuts later in life because it's going to become your MO. And people like Jason Blair, uh, they would have been unethical had they been a lawyer or a cop or a, oh. because that's more of a character, character, uh, character trait than it is, you know, I, mean, I, I think if anything, I, I mean, newsrooms are, don't foster that those kinds of people. I mean, those people already get there bringing that with, you know, it, it's like the last place you think that something like that or someone like that would grow in. Mm -hmm. And, and it's because they arrived there with that little seed already, you know, ready to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I keep agreeing with Macarena, but maybe that's because she's always right. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the main point, and I have taught journalism myself uh, for a few semesters at different schools. And the one thing I tried to drive home was like, we often talk about uh, journalistic ethics, right? And what I always thought the students was actually just take the word journalistic out because ethics are ethics, you know? I mean, like most of the things that we label journalistic ethics are just ethics. And, oh. and there they would be ethics in every other area of life as well. And that's why I so strongly agree with Macarena's point, which is that if these folks like these or any of the other great fabri fabricators of, of, of all time had gone into banking, they would have probably, you know, been stealing money out of the, out of the money drawer, you know, or, or something. It's just, unfortunately, the way they, they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it is good to raise these cautionary tales and these warnings to young people about you know, how much damage you can do to yourself and others by doing it. But I actually do have faith that, you know, most people actually do see the difference between right and wrong mm -hmm. and do apply it, you know, in their professional life. I like to ask my students, do you, you know, um, <laughs> lawyers have to pass a bar to practice and doctors have to be licensed to practice. Should we have some kind of, you know, mechanism for journalists other than we have trust, obviously, that we have to earn, but should there be some kind of a, a system in place for us, for journalists as well? Um, you know, you like to think that we can just build the trust and run on that, hopefully, right? But it's something to think about. And I'm gonna ask a question that Adam Sennett, the president of the New England chapter has put in the chat. He asks, how do you both feel about having these two, Glass and Blair, um, having a uh, figuring such a big impact in your lives do you ever feel like these stories overshadow the other great work that you have done or are doing I'm no. start with Chuck or macarena first go ahead no not at all i you know honestly the only people that are could still interested are fellow journalists <laughs> usually right. um and uh over like over Thanksgiving, my niece said, oh, Tia, I Googled you. You were involved <laughs> in this thing? This guy stole your story? What? And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> now you're a celebrity for your niece. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, it's like uh, I was saying before, I kind of can't believe that, um, you know, 23 years later, we're, we're still talking about this. Um, I appreciate the fact that Adam thinks I have done some great work <laughs> um, to be overshadowed. So thank you for that, Adam. Um, it 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 feels like actually it has been it has been almost all upside. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. It's it's been a cool ride. I've gotten to meet a lot of interesting people. They made a movie. I mean, you know, it's it's been exciting. Um, there are times when I feel that. Um, it, it just, you know, can we finally just drop it? You know, I mean, yeah. but uh, it is, uh, she mentions her niece, you know, I, 
I have a daughter who's 17 now. I've got older ones too, but the 17 year old has never seen the movie. And I, and, and I just realized like she was born like a year after the movie came out. So, and you know, you guys won't believe this shit. I said, well, we should watch. He says, nah, I'm not interested in that. So that's the important thing right there is like the kids, the younger generation has already forgotten about it. So not interested just, anymore. For me, it gave me a look at the other side of my profession, right? As a journalist, mm-hmm. I was always the one on the, the one writing the story, but to be the one written about, it gave me a really a great insight on the mistakes we make as journalists and some of them are so minor. And I think that it's only gotten worse because of this click culture and this like, let's let's upload faster. Yep. Um, and, and it is kind of terrifying if you're ever caught in the eye of a media hurricane, you know, um, because the kind of attention and the kind of, and, 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 and you get to see, I, I feel like it allowed me front row seats to be able to witness the, the anatomy of a story and how a story emerges and then what parts of a story be, people become fixated on and what gives, what gives breath and life to, a, to an angle of the story more than others. And oftentimes it's not because it's the most important thing. It's because that's what the reporter had access to or, or that's the story that everyone keeps thinking about. And I think a lot about that, especially because I grew up on the Texas-Mexico border. And when I tell people that I'm going home, people are like, oh my God, be careful. And I'm like, my home, because of the the one story the national media chooses to tell about where I, where I come from, people haven't. People think you're gonna get shot out by cartel members, or you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna run into immigrants down the street. I mean, it's so it gives me a real idea of the ways, in the subtle ways in which we get it wrong, you know. And for me as a teacher, that's been very, very instructional. Mm. The the probably probably part of everyone's training in journalism should be, you have to be the subject of a big story. Uh, yes. <laughs> because I, I couldn't agree, again, I'm agreeing with Macarena, but she yeah. put her finger on something that was so, yeah. that was so important to me in terms of my own development professionally about this experience is I was on the other side of the camera or whatever it is, and I was being written about. And it's disconcerting at times, you know, it's a thrill at times too, no question. Um, but not everybody's, not everybody's going to write what you, the story the way you like it. And to have that experience is, you know, it hurts at times, but it's valuable. And it may, I believe it made me better at, at what I do. Mm-hmm. Me too. Me too. That's really good to hear. Um, maybe just to wrap up, I'm just checking if, see if there's any other questions, but, um, it, it, you know, fast forward to the present. Is there anything that you guys are working on, you know, projects that you want to share? that are you know, not necessarily related to Blair and, to Blair and Glass. Anybody want to share? Well, I'm, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, middle school and high school uh, students and teachers with media literacy. And I think, um, I think in, in a lot of regions, especially down here in, this, in, in South Texas, like the misinformation is a type of terrorism, you mm-hmm. know, and it's tearing communities apart. Um, It is breaking down the conversation. And I just feel like I can't wait until schools start having uh, media, media literacy courses, because I think that's where we need to move. Because younger people who are growing up on TikTok, and are growing up not on the 6pm news, you know, like, uh, like earlier generations where there was like four people giving you a version of the news. Now there's just so many and I feel like that's really the next frontier mm-hmm. is really educating young people to be smarter media consumers. And starting earlier, I love to hear that you're talking about uh, middle school and high school. That's really great, Macarena. Thank you. How about you, uh, Chuck? Anything that you're working on that you wanna share? Well, um, thank you for asking. And it's gonna be on a little bit of a sad note. My last but I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. My last column for the paper sign column was a remembrance of the late Fred Hyatt, who was the editor of the post editorial page 
and died suddenly just a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. um, at the age of 66. And he was, um, we've talked a lot about bad managers tonight. Fred really epitomized what it is to be a great manager in the newspaper business. Um, and I believe had a tremendous um, passion for human rights uh, which infused everything we try to do on the post editorial page. And um, if, if I could make one recommendation to the group here, we published in addition to my piece, um, some of the rest of the staff's remembrances of Fred and some of Fred's own writings from over the years, which I'm sure many will find room for disagreement with here and there. But since, uh, since I have the floor, I'd just like to use it to say uh, what a great man, what a great journalist, and what a great friend he was. And uh, I would urge everybody on the call to uh, make some time to look at his work uh, that we republished over the years. Oh, thank you. That's a, that's a good cap on this conversation to talk about, end up talking about the good work that we're doing as journalists. Um, I want to thank both of you for such a candid, um, enlightening conversation. Thank you very much. I love the way you uh, interacted with each other, um, was wonderful too. And, and thank you to the New England chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists for putting this program together. Um, we're all very dedicated SPJ members, we're all volunteers. Um, we're all passionate about our profession. And thank you for inspiring us tonight, Macarena and Chuck. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. This, this thank will be available you on YouTube. We're going to uh, make this uh, video available on YouTube for others to share it with. And I will never watch Thanks. it because I hate watching myself. <laughs> <laughs> you can pass the link along. <laughs> Thank you.